Simple Fast of Castle listeners. Now today we are going to be listening to a podcast that recorded a while ago, as many of these podcasts are. So if anything happens to me and I die, there'll probably be Simple Passive Cash little podcast going on for another year and a half. So just in case you're wondering. But we have lots of staff to kind of help me get these episodes out in case I cease to live on this planet. Now, I've got a kid. And the way I'm doing the whole college savings thing is you know, I'm creating an infinite banking program where I just stuff a whole bunch of money into here. And I'm going to invest it in the first decade or two of the kid's life. But as they reach the end of their high school career and they may look to go to college, that is when I'll start. Instead of taking 100% loans on my infinite banking and investing in better investments, making money two places, that's when I'll start to replenish it if they need it. And this is why I don't know why anybody does 529 plans because number one, it's just garbage investments. I mean, it's like the 401k investing for the clueless. And number two, you can only use it for educational stuff for the infinite banking. If your kid just wants to go to Portland and drink coffee and play their guitar or whatever kids do these days, you can use that money in your infinite banking to invest more so you can go live your own life or do whatever you want. And I think that's for those two big things, like 529s, don't do it guys, like seriously. Get an infinite banking program. I think it's a great way to use for your savings for this type of stuff. Check out the free infinite banking e-course at simplepassivecashflow.com slash banking. You can get access to it over there, or at least read the, the quick primer on this. We've had some last podcasts on that topic. But if you guys uh, are in Seattle, I'll be up there next weekend. Go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash event. So I'm to travel and I'm on my way to, I always stop over at one of a lot of our investors are in California, the West Coast, and meet as many as you as possible, especially people who join the club, uh, simplepassivecashflow.com slash club. You've booked your onboarding call. You know, I want to get to know you guys, and I want to attract the right people into our culture and our community and see who's a good fit for our family office group, which is our inner circle. Again, we want to get to know you guys. Join the club, simplepassivecashflow.com slash club. You guys have friends, family, have them sign up on that link too. Another reason to sign up for that link is you get access to inside stuff that I'm doing. I'm actually going off to somewhere past Seattle. I'm not going to say where, but um, it's going to be cool. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different than some people are used to. But uh, you only get access to that if you join the club. Be with the cool kids. This is a story about a dude named Lane. And then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one of the rest of me. Hey, Simple Passive cash flow listeners. Today, we are going to talk to a college admissions expert, try and get you guys, kids into college. Maybe they're not so smart. Maybe they don't have enough <laughs> extracurricular activities. College maybe isn't everything, but in my opinion, it's great for networking and it gets people up to a certain level. Maybe college is the new high school these days. But if you guys haven't seen the Netflix special, I was watching it, it was super fascinating. And it, it's called Operation Varsity Blues on Netflix. I highly suggest it, but it's a, a college admissions scandal. It took us a while to figure out what the heck this guy's name was because it was, seems to be like disappeared from the internet. It was Rick Singer. So he figured out this way to get people in the side door where the back door is the people will pay like a boatload of money, like, I don't know, like quarter of a million, millions of dollars to get people into the top colleges. Basically, they would find all these sports teams that nobody ever wanted to join, like boating, the yacht club or whatever, and they'd make fake profiles. They call this the side door, and it was a lot cheaper and a lot of very high net worth people. And I'll be honest, whether it's morally right or wrong, I would see a lot of high net worth people thinking about this type of stuff. With it being a doggy dog world out, and maybe your kids are just a little spoiled or... You know I mean, as most second, third generation kids are, right? Nothing to your guys' fault. It is what it is. Let's just call it out. By giving your kids or grandchildren a college education in your mind, and I would probably agree that at least you keep them off the streets in a way. So this is important stuff and it might be worth the risk, but we're going to talk a little bit about how to do this the straight arrow way. Our guest here, Anadia De Silva Kilgore, who runs a company called Personal College Consulting. So she works individually with people to do this the legit but thanks Anadia for jumping on hey no problem thanks for having me yeah why don't you give us a little bit about your background how you got into this type of uh, niche field sure so 
I'm actually an attorney by trade. That's what I've been doing for 27, eight plus years. And got into the college thing by trial by fire a little bit through when our son was going through it and friends and so forth. And we just, we found out so much about what they're looking for and how to work the angles and up your profile. And actually it's important at all different social economic levels, because if you have financial need, you're in a different formula. And then my husband and I were like, we're getting zero financial aid money, but I still don't want to overpay. So what we found out about was this whole other world of what's called merit aid that's out there. And that's not based on finances at all. It's based on how does your student stand out, fit, or excel at the particular institution they're looking for, and that there's scholarship and or grant money there to entice you to go there instead of somewhere else, because basically they're giving you a discount. And you need to know if you want that or to bridge the gap between what you have saved or can afford for college. That's really important because all things being equal, why would you want to pay 50 if you can pay 40 or pay 30 instead of 40 or whatever it is that your range is comfortable at? So that varies for every family, like where those numbers come in to be. But the point is that those funds are out there and you have to know where they are, how much is possible to get. And if your student's in the running for those funds, because just because it's there doesn't mean they're going to get it. Right. So it is a start with the number side, which is very similar to any other business, especially mine. People come in for deals, investment returns, taxes. But then as you grow your business, you start to realize a lot of the big um, benefits people get is more on the softer side that the consulting of the students to get them ready for that admission process. Absolutely. For me, it's all about the metrics and setting the proper foundation for each student. So the more time we have, the better. And then really advancing what we have for them so they pop at wherever they're looking for. But you run into a lot of times where either the parent or the, they only know the schools that generally everyone knows or are local to them. And they might not even know why they know that school or why they think it's good. I've just heard of it. Or Mary Jo's friend went there or whoever. And I'm like, yes, but what do you want to get out of it? Because you need to match that up. So I take that emotional side out of it and really focus on where's the best ideal fit for what this kid can excel. At. I'm in my later 30s now. I think I know a little bit more about the colleges more than the parents out there, but I'm getting to a point where I'm admittedly just saying that this college is a good football team or <laughs> university in Southern California is like this type of student. I don't even know if Arizona State is the best party school out there. I'm behind <laughs> on the time. I guess if you wanted to search by party schools, we could, if that's the important criteria. Generally, that's something we might highlight is that a school is notable for, but it's certainly not generally what we But you're, you do this every day. And I think this is why a, really, a lot of smart people, not only for college stuff or this types of need is you go and hire consultants, people that right. live, read this stuff all day and you pay them for what they're worth. And you're smart enough to know that you're not an expert of this. Yeah, it's very helpful, especially where, where people with higher incomes, we're also busy working and doing what we need to do to keep our earnings up, that you don't have the time to dedicate to really doing a good search that fits the needs of your particular student. They're on their own. And there's certainly not any kind of guidance like this at school. They're, that's not their job, honestly. Their job is to get your kid through high school. The less problems they have, the better student they are, the less attention they get on that matter. And that's just the way it goes. So before we dig into the process of what you work with these clients on, let's have some fun. What are the kind of the top three schools that are the most value that people wouldn't think of otherwise, just off the top of your head? Oh, that's tough because we have... Because people listen to podcasts and they like this free content that they get. And a lot <laughs> of people, they just listen because they want to sound cool in front of their friends. So let's give them... Uh, I'll tell you one thing. For example, the Ivy Leagues are fantastic, of course. But for you to really get funds at an Ivy League, you have to have financial need. So if you're a high earner and you have a talented student, obviously, to get in there, you're not going to get money from them. 
But then there's amazing other schools that we only have eight Ivy Leagues and we have over 4,000 colleges. So come on, do the math. There's a bunch of amazing schools out there. So for example, I have one student from last year's class going to Middlebury up in Vermont, right? That school, she got, I think, a total of $306,000 over four years. So basically costing $1,400 out per year. I think that's a slam dunk, right? So you have to know where these schools are, where these pockets are that are fantastic. It's considered a little ivy and it's perfect for her. And yet she hadn't even heard about it or knew how great it was for the program she was looking for. And it was amazing. So that one just comes to the top of my head because it was such an opportunity for that family. Any other couple real quick? You can look at some of the schools. Well, I'm East Coast based, so of course I'm going to have a preference for out here. But Hofstra tends to give out a lot of good scholarship money, has really good programs. And if you want to go out into central New York and you're more tech-minded, one of their great tech schools is uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. Not only has all the tech programs as a STEM-based college, but has a business school and all sorts of communications and media majors as well. So it's really a nice mix of a lot of different things that you might not think of when you think of a STEM-based school. And they also tend to give out very good aid. And then I guess the opposite of that, what are the, uh, the, the overrated schools that you think? Maybe here are some of mine. <laughs> I hope I don't offend anybody. But uh, <laughs> yeah, everybody gets offended these days, right? There's so many different podcasts and colleges. Go to one of those guys. But, but just so you understand the kind of the type I'm thinking about, like University of San Francisco, University of Pacific, they're expensive, maybe not the best, but it's just for folks that couldn't get into SC and stuff like that. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. But if I'm told, this is not what I do. So it's just whatever. <laughs> like my opinion means nothing in this. What are some that are like overrated that a lot of people will go to, but you're like, man, really? Really depends on the region you're in because you're going to- Or folks are on the West Coast. Exactly. So I'm going to have a more generic answer to that in that a lot of times you have your big state schools that- your Div 1 powerhouses and football and whatnot. So everybody knows that. So it's like, yeah, I'm going to wherever. And then you look at the metrics of the students that go there. I'm like, really? That's the best one you wanted to get into? And all right, for me, that's overrated because if metrics grade-wise, SAT-wise are way better than their average, and that's what you settled on, and you didn't get funds for going, I, I don't understand those decisions. That, to me, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Any anecdotes in, off the top of your head that kid went here when you think they maybe should have been better off here for a certain... Sure. I have one that's going to our flagship uh, state university, which is University of Massachusetts Amherst, which is a very good school. Hard to get into, but she got into a different state school in another state in New England, that gave her $120,000 if she had gone there. So she could have gone there for half the price and the difference would have paid for grad school going after. So I'm like, again, I'm metrics and money-based. I don't understand that decision, but you can only lead them down the path and eventually everyone has to make their own decisions. Right, right. So she definitely didn't pick the least cost nor necessarily the best rate. She picked the one that... I think had the better party scene. Better football team. There you go. So there's so many other like subjective factors, like I say, that go into it. But my approach is to focus on the metrics of it. What does the student really look for academically? What are they looking for socially? If they have an extracurricular that they're passionate about or good at, that should stay in the mix. Because once you take it out at that level, you can't get it back in later. And then financially, what fits uh, the needs financially of the family so that you're getting realistic about, all right, if, even if I can get into the school, how are you going to pay for it? So you need to know that your chances of getting money there are going to range from X to Y. And if that's not enough, then we shouldn't be focusing on that school. A lot of these colleges, the pros and cons of them. But for somebody listening that is that podcast, the cheapo person that doesn't want to pony up and pay an expert like yourself, 
what is like that minimum effective dose that they can do? What do they go? What is that that magazine that's probably very uh, biased day to day or whatever? Uh, U.S. News and World Report. Yeah, whatever that is, or the J.D. Power and Associates of College <laughs> magazine or something like that. But like whatever the heck that it's worth. Is that the best thing people have? If they no. want to do it the cheap and easy way? No, but it's one that I use to point out rankings because everyone's familiar with it. So there's a lot of different resources. And I think the rankings should be maybe the last factor you factor into as a tiebreaker. For example, I'm looking at this school and that one. Everything's coming in about the same. And then you look at a ranking and say, oh, maybe this one's more well-known or whatever. And that can help you in, in those things. But I don't think you should be picking schools to start with based on U.S. News and World Report's rankings, because one of my pet peeves with them is it doesn't compare apples to apples. They have everything chopped up in different segments. So you have national college rankings, you have national liberal arts school rankings, then you have regional north, regional south, regional mid mess, blah, 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 blah. So how do you know what you're really picking? One of the other lists I like because it's just a number. Again, I just like numbers, right? If you look at the Forbes list, if you even make the Forbes list, I think you're in good company because they only rank about 1,600 colleges in the U.S., not 4,000. And they just give Be you- better, better than most list, right? Yeah, you're in the top third practically already. And then they just give you a number, one to 1,600. That's great. And then you have things like the Washington Review, which really did a good in-depth study over- a long period of time and analyzed, okay, this is what it's going to cost you to go here. And what's your return on investment after five years, 10 years, 40 years? And that's where you can really go and look and go, oh, maybe the school really is overrated if my return on investment is only X after so many years. So you want to look at those things. And then you have stuff like the Princeton Review, you have FISCs. There's a lot of different outlets out there that have spent time looking at schools, but not just because they want to get into U.S. News and World Reports. They're analyzing them based on how well do the students do after they graduate? What are they employed in? What are they making? How much did it impact their social status? How did they feel about the campus? And how was their experience over four years? There's so many different things that, to look at there and then give you an idea if that's a good value. I really like Prince's best I think 365 colleges, I think they put that out every year. And they really focus on schools that have a good value. So again, that concept of return on investment and maybe schools you're not as familiar with because they're not huge names, but they do really well for their students. Yeah, that word value, that makes people's ears perk up on this, the, the audience. They love All that about value. value. I yeah. want value for my dollar. Yeah, the price is the number you pay, but the value is what you get. Exactly. exactly. And I always tell parents when it comes to the social aspect of schools, I'm like, be realistic. You need to have them engaged and want to be on campus and involved because for those of us that all have been through college, I'm like, what are you going to do between Thursday night and Monday morning? Not study, probably. So what else is going on campus or nearby? And if it's not what you want, then that's not where you should be. Yeah, well, That's what my parents thought. I don't know why they spent all that money for that. But, but yes, yeah, so again, check out that Operation Varsity Blues Netflix show, but they talked about the uh, the Lori Laughlin scandal, and it was not only her, it was also that, who's this, the H. Macy guy? That actually got in trouble. Yeah. You'll, you'll see her name come up. She paid, now, again, I've watched the same special, and I've, obviously I have an interest in this stuff. She got in trouble because she paid someone else. And what she didn't realize is she was paying someone else to take her daughter's SAT. And what she was sold was that Rick Singer told her, oh, no, I have a contact. You can pay. So she gets more time to take the test because she might have some kind of learning difficulty or whatever. And there are some ways to do that if you really did need it. But what he ended up doing was... This was not the real test. This was a whole side thing he arranged with someone else reviewing her answers so her score was way better and then somehow submitting that to the college board. That's just cheating, right. straight up. So what are some things you'll work with folks that are a lot more moral and straight arrow that I think a lot of people just don't realize is in the, the bucket of tricks folks yeah, can do? Uh, we don't do anything like the, 
what this was doing. That's crazy. But you do want to maximize your portfolio as far as the student's identity goes. And the more you can, like I said, pop at the university that you're trying to match with, the better. So take advantage of everything that that student them. So if it's a sport and they want to play, well, first let's get real about how good are they at it so that you can target the right division of schools. Are we looking at a Div 1 athlete, a Division 2, a Division 3? They're all different. And then make sure that you're identifying schools that will value that aspect of them. So if you have a hockey player that's applying to a school that doesn't have a hockey team, it really doesn't matter now, does it, how great he is at that sport. That's just silly. You want to make sure the things are in their mix and that fit their level of talent and interest. And that the school values that. And when I say they value it, they're going to give you some funds for choosing them. And that doesn't necessarily have to be tied in as a sports scholarship because you're really only going to get that at a Div 1. So that's an easy one. But let's just say you just have a smart kid, but they're really not uh, athletically inclined. They must have some interests. So you want to make sure there's other things in there for them. But the first thing to do is diversify by geography. I always look at these things as tiebreakers. This person has the same profile as another person, same grades, scores, SATs, whatever. But everybody that's going to this school is from, and you're applying from Ohio or California or Nebraska. Right off the bat, you're going to stand out because you are diversifying their geographical profile versus everybody else that comes from primarily the same area that they're used to seeing. I know the UCs, right? If you're an outsider, it's extremely difficult to get in. Where the UCs, it's difficult, but it's not like impossible probability-wise to get into a UC from Hawaii or an outside state. And that's because your state schools are always going to be financially in the best value, if you will, especially if you're a high earning family that's not going to get any financial aid, you're going to pay sticker price. At least the sticker price is that. But what I do with that information, I use that as my baseline. How close can I get to that number, if not better, with other schools? And generally speaking, other schools that are private have more funds to work with. And sometimes, again, depending how you stand out, another school, state school might come in less expensive for you depending on what's going on. Because remember, you're paying a premium to go out of state somewhere else. So right away, just economically, they have more to work with. Do you understand? Got it. So, so if, if someone has, for example, what I call a rah-rah school in mind, they may not be an athlete, but they really want to be involved in that big campus spirit. Another state school that is very well known and very good might actually come in less expensive on net dollars than your local one. And I've had that happen as well. So let's take a, a kid who's not very good at sports. He's about a buck 50. Um, <laughs> not the smartest kid either. Plays a little call, pretty good at Call of Duty. Yeah, maybe D&D. Yeah. Colleges don't look for that. Like, where do you, take us through your process. So you start working with a kid ideally like earlier or like junior year. What's? Oh my God. If I have my blank slate, I want to start working with a kid as a freshman because starting freshman year in high school, you are starting the foundation of everything that's going to come later. So when we look at GPAs as uh, seniors for applying, for example, that GPA is not just a number. It's based on the strength of your schedule as well. So someone with a 3.0 versus someone with a 3.0 who took all AP classes versus someone who took all basket weaving has different credentials, right? So it's strength of schedule plays in. So you always want this to be doing as well as they can do in the hardest kind of class they can handle. And the, the problem with that is if you don't address this till junior year, it's too late. It's not going to make a difference later and you can't level up, if you will. Yeah. It's like riding uh, a bike. You can't handle it. Yeah. They go ride a tricycle. But whatever it is, we need to know where their lane is and then build on that. So if I can get them early, it's great. And then you want to start seeing where their other interests are. I don't care what they do, to tell you the truth, as long as they like and they get good at it. 
there's, I think, a misperception that you have to have a million extracurriculars and have all sorts of pro bono activities and things going on. And that just, that's not necessary. If you're good and passionate about something, do that and stand out at it, but figure out what that is. So start early, figure it out, and then pursue it. So it's important to do that. And then I, that what is starting as to be a profile for this kid and they see where they're at. And then I start looking for schools that speak to their strengths. So if you have someone that's STEM-based inclined and they really love you, you should stick to those type of schools rather than looking maybe for the liberal arts. But the opposite is true. You have a very articulate, great writer and they excel at the history and English and really math and science is not their best things, don't put them in an environment that's going to stress those type of academics versus the ones that they're better at. But also keeping their, I'm about opportunities and keeping their world open. Because a lot of times what happens at the high school level, you don't even know what you don't know yet. There are so many majors out there that you probably never even heard of. So the idea is to get into the right environment in a college or university atmosphere so they can explore that but you have to set that environment. And what works for one does not work for the other. My other pet peeve with these counselors at schools that I just don't think are helpful at all, they'll just set them off on a little computer program and say, hey, go look at that. And the problem with that is it's gonna always start with the same. You want a small school, a big school, a suburban school, an urban school? Do you want a campus? Do you not want a campus? All these questions. I'm like, how do they know if they haven't even been anywhere yet? You have to compare apples to start figuring that out. But don't go willy-nilly looking all over the world for this. You should start with the metrics that make sense for you and then look at them in different environments and start seeing what stands out for the student. How does like the cadence of like interaction work the if the parents are smart they'll sign you up very early right like maybe fresh ideally year, what do you meet with them an hour for zoom every quarter twice oh my a goodness. year or stuff? depends when we start and how much time because i'm all about a, a project-based approach so i want to set the universe with the research of who i think we should start poking at so the more time i have the more they can consider then i want the students feedback and we'll talk through those different things. And then you start to see the patterns emerge. What's standing out to them? What's speaking to them? And then we're going to start zeroing in on which ones you should reach out to, maybe try to get some feedback on coaches or admissions, and then setting those visits and becoming known to that institution so that you're on their radar. So generally speaking, I'm talking to them to start with at least once a month. And as things ramp up, it's weekly, daily, text, Zoom, telephone calls. It's a very fluid and cooperative Building of rapport thing. with the kid. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times we're texting at 10 o'clock at night, just like, hey, what you think of that? Oh, that's great. Did zip me off this. And then, and then when I want something a little bit more formal, it's usually on a Zoom meeting. Most of the kids until they're seniors aren't even driving. So it doesn't matter if they're local or far, it's the same thing. And we'll go through it. And then as seniors before, like this time of year in the summer, this is when I want my seniors writing the essays. So we'll go back and forth. Give me some drafts. Let's spin off some ideas. And then I'll look at them and go, okay, what do you think here? And we'll go through it sentence by sentence, word by word, till we have hammered it down. Because you have a word limit and you want to make sure that you're conveying your idea articulately and accurately what you're trying to say, but at the same time, beef up your profile if you can in that sort of uh, way. So it's nuts to soup, right? Start to finish all the way through until they commit. It, it would seem to me like the parents that are signing up for this type of stuff, they might be a little bit more on the overbearing side. And maybe do you see any, are some of the kids in it too, or are there or more detractors? Well, that's a requirement for me. I'm like, the first thing I say to the parent is one, the student has to want to work with me because I put a ton of time and effort into this and I want their feedback. I want them to be able to communicate and articulate their thoughts with me. And if they're not interested in doing that, honestly, I don't have time for that. The parent can step back or be as involved as they want, but for the most part, I'm working one-on-one -on -one with the student most of the time. 
some parents are more hands-on than others, and then others just can't follow directions. I'm like, they, they say they want help and guidance, and I tell them exactly what to do, and they're always too busy to get there. Like, if you're too busy now, it's just going to get busier as they get closer to that graduation date. Then they run the gamut all over the place. But wouldn't it be nice that like, the parents just let the expert do its job and kind of help as they come along, or is it? need to be and they're wonderful <laughs> they're the dream clients they're great yeah from the kids that get the most out of it what kind of a relationship with the parents do they have i can see some kid they may not want to go to college right yeah their parents yeah. make multiple six figures at their day job because they got to college and they have this big degree but what if, if they're they, if their student doesn't want to go to college honestly they shouldn't be working with me that i am not their shrink or psychologist i'm not here to change who they are. I'm here to present them in the best light possible and find them the best situations where they can thrive. And that's different for each student. Like I'll have some students that are super talented and then I have others that have the drive and desire. But like you said earlier, they're not the top students, but they still want to go there and they still have ambition to do certain things. So we have to make sure we're looking at the right schools for them there's a place for them if they want it but if they don't want it they're not going to go anywhere so they I, have to follow through i think those two instances those examples that's workable but i think the the listeners their worst nightmare is a capable semi-capable kid and just they're just interested in different things right they, they go are that. and i have one client now where the student is actually very smart and talented and the mom is very nice but overbearing and they don't communicate well at all. I'm always like the buffer. And what she wants and what he wants don't really line up a lot. So it's, do you want this? If you want this, let's go down and do it this way. And then again, do they follow through or not? Sometimes the parents do. Sometimes the student does more or not. But she was all hung up on one Ivy school. And I finally had to say to her, He's really smart, but he's not getting in there. And he doesn't Those... even want to go there. So no, but I'm just like, I don't get it. It was more about her status than what was better for him. And he flat out said, I have no interest in going there. And Hello. when I watched that, that <laughs> Netflix special, like that became very apparent to me. I didn't realize it because I don't have kids that age, but like, it's a big pissing contest, right? Which school your kids go. And that's why that guy was able to take such advantage of high paying, uh, ridiculous fees, because it had nothing to do with the student. It was all about the status for the parents. And that's unfortunate. That's not what we're doing here. I'm all about the student and letting them know, hey, oh, you're interested in game design? Wow, do you know that there's these schools here that do this and they're like the best in the country if you really want to do and their eyes might pop oh my god that's great i would love to learn more about that because that's their interest does mom and dad want to do that no what about somebody who's really interested in youtube and all this stuff type of stuff but they don't put any effort into anything what where do you as a counselor come in and see that stuff where their grades are at yeah. It depends. It depends where they're at. They could still do very well, but academically, is that where their interest is? I don't know. But as a side note, what's gotten really popular on a lot of college campuses is esports. Do you know what that is? Something that's very competitive. And I would advise people not get into that, is my opinion. Because my thing is about what is it you're okay or but what is it there's no competition? Esports is incredibly competitive. But it's a club right? It gives yeah. these like geeky kids that just want to play video games an outlet to, all right, I can still be a good student and then I can still go do some of this with kids yeah. of like-minded. Yeah. This is probably a subject more for the Rich Uncle channel, right? Another YouTube channel I do, but from my business perspective, right? Like when you're writing content, you're, look, you're writing for what is what is needed out there, but what is low competition. Some of the worst, I might be wrong about this, but like some of the worst, um, occupations in the future like computer programming perhaps because everybody's doing it and when everybody does it compensation goes down and it just becomes more of a rat race now i'm not saying i'm not saying i'm true true and people who are computer programmers please do not get offended stay away from the things that are highly competitive that you especially if you don't want to do it 
first place. Yeah. One thing, if you don't want to do it in the first place, you shouldn't even be considering it. But you have hit something, a topic that I try to stress to the parents and the students at this level. Because remember, I'm dealing with high school students and I encourage them unless they really are hell-bent a particular profession, I really encourage them at this point in time to not pick a job. Don't think you're going to call this to just be X, because most people graduate and go work in something completely different than what they thought they were going to do, or they go in thinking they're going to be a something major, and then five majors later, there's something else. My focus is, what are you good at? What do you enjoy actually putting the time into to do well with? And let's make sure we're getting you into an environment academic that has more things in that arena. Because I believe that then they'll figure out their path and and start to follow what what makes them excited. It might be a, a bad example, but kids, they might have the foresight to know, oh, there's business school. Oh, business make money. I want to make money. Is that not a legitimate like interests. To me, it's just, dude, what do you know about business? I think if you can get into the zone when you're doing something and it involves numbers or ratios or calculations and you lose track of time doing that kind of stuff, then yeah, I think you're going to be more business, math, economics minded. And that should be maybe something you want to consider. But if it's like torture to get through those type of endeavors then why would you be focusing a career on yeah i know myself the only reason i became an engineer because that's what i was brainwashed to do and i one day i googled what do engineers make and they're like on the top of the list without having to go to grad school so (laughs) i didn't i didn't talk to anybody like yourself i just went down that linear path but yeah I don't know. Part of me, let me know your thoughts on this is just get them down the line. Just get them to college so they can actually grow up and actually get closer to the end game. Yes, you know, I call it hunting. I think college, and I'm a very big advocate of living on campus. So, again, getting your boots on the ground that this is the environment you want to be in because I want them to stay there. I don't want them to come home every weekend or hardly ever because they should be immersed in the experience. But the reason for that is that. It's really a bridge to adulting. This is where a lot of kids are going to learn how to grow up and take care of themselves and do things in semi-controlled environments still so there's a safety net. And that's important. Otherwise, you get out and then what? You don't even know how to make yourself dinner or wash your laundry and go to work. That's a basic skill. (laughs) Let's get there. But if you're just always being coddled by mom and dad, all you have to do is open a book. That's only a small piece of being able to be successful later. I I think a lot of people in our community, the younger and the older folks, because we have two splits in our in our community. Like the younger guys, they've been lucky enough to fall in a high paid salary position where they get a hundred, a couple hundred grand right out of college. These guys will go into that and then figure out this financial independence, investing, all these alternative investing type of ideas. And use that as a way to get on the highway to go wherever they want to go in life. Where the people who found this stuff a little later, it's a little bit too late to find your passion and your career. So you just work it, Mm -hmm. fortunately. What would make me really happy is that every kid I helped with found their passion and came out doing something. Because I'll tell you what my definition of success is for my students. You get into a college that you really wanted to go to. You graduate in four years. You get out and you get a job doing something you like that allows you to be independent and pay your own. To me, that is the definition of success for someone coming out of college. My definition of success, not having too much time to think about it, is go to a college, don't get into drugs, don't drop (laughs) out, don't be the person who like jumps off a roof and does it and misses the swimming pool and dies or Uh, something like that. Get your, punch yourself to a job where you can learn a skill and then get good at that skill set, but then use that skill set to get to that next level and then figure out what you want from there. So we're close. Yeah. You still got to yeah. get through in one piece and out yeah. the other side. I'm a little bit more about punting. Get them <laughs> down the road. Right? Yeah, but, get them down the road. But I want to set them on the right road because I think if you go down that wrong path, passively showing up somewhere because you didn't really give it much thought, I don't think you're going to have a very vested interest in doing well there. And there's so much time and money to be wasted if you start off wrong and then have to transfer. 
you never get all those credits. You never get all that time back. And it's a waste. I see it as 90% of wealth for these families are two to three generations. And I think part of this has to do with it. I'm a big believer in consultants these days for things like this. I mean, yeah, you went to well, college. You didn't, you're not an expert on college admissions. <laughs> well, there you go. It's, I'm a lawyer. So when people come to me, they need legal advice. But I can't tell you how many times a conversation will start with friend did this. And I'm like, that's great, but that's not correct. But if you don't want to hear that, then don't come to me because <laughs> I'm going to tell you what you do or shouldn't do in a particular situation when it's in my field. But before we get your contact information out there, any last like parting words for parents, maybe with teenagers, young teenagers now that they're busy, they've got money to spend on this type of stuff, but any other things that you should be thinking or doing day to day before? Just make sure that your students engaged and and actually living the process, have them do the best they can. I feel the student's job, honestly, as a high schooler is just to be the best student they can be and let the rest fall in place. You don't have to overstress them out about everything. Just let them be the best they can be at whatever they're interested in and go with it. Have to say, oh, you have to play this sport or you have to volunteer here or do all these other extra things to stand out. And I'm like, why? They're probably perfectly fine exactly the way they are if you just let them be who they want to be and then go with it. Some of these kids are rebels. Not saying that was me. My parents saying it, that'd be the last thing I do. So It'd be cool to have somebody like you to talk with and help me. Through. Well, yeah. And I think that the kids, and that's one of the reasons I like to do the one-on-one with the kids, because they can tell me something they're not going to say in front of mom and dad. How far away do you want to go or not far away? And some, somebody might just say, as far away as I can get from them would be the best. I'm like, okay, let's go with it. That's not a wrong answer, but it might not be an answer they're necessarily comfortable uttering out loud in front of them. But yeah, people want to get a hold of you. I want you to get your contact information. Sure. So my phone number is 508-622-5250. My email is nod, N-O-D, which is my nickname because so many people can't pronounce my first name, at personalcollegecounseling.com. And personalcollegecounseling.com is the website. And it's also our Instagram. Hopefully you guys found this useful today. Again, we're not giving any legal tax parenting advice because if you thought you we were, what are you guys doing? Seriously, this is a free podcast. But, but yeah, if you guys haven't yet, please join the club, simplepassacashflow.com slash club. Book the onboarding call. I'd like to get to know you guys out there and we'll see you guys at a future event. All right. Thank you. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.